Welcome to In Conversation with writer and editor Sheila Bender. Discussions on writing and the writing life. A monthly chat with writers, publishers, and those who support the literary arts. Today, Sheila is talking with Indiana writer Barbara Stahura about her book, After Brain Injury, Telling Your Story. Hello, this is Sheila Bender, and you're listening to In Conversation with Sheila Bender, Discussions on Writing and the Writing Life. Today, I'm interviewing and having a conversation with Barbara Stahura, who now lives in Indiana after years of living in Tucson. She's been a writer for a long time, 20 years of freelance writing, and before that, writing for a corporation. And in her current work, she's concentrating on writing about and teaching people with brain trauma and brain injury about journaling in order to, Barbara, you'll help me later, preserve their memory and build their memory. She is the editor of a journal called Brain Injury Journey, Hope, Help, and Healing. And she is, before that, the author of a memoir that includes essays about her husband's accident that led to brain injury. Her memoir is called What I Thought I Knew. It's told in a series of linked personal essays. She's also the co-author of After Brain Injury, Telling Your Story. And it is the first journaling book for people with brain injury. She's a contributor to Feathers Brush My Heart 2, More True Stories of Gifts from the Afterlife, edited by Sinclair Browning. She's had a long and varied writing history for all kinds of journals from New Age, Science, and Business. Uh, She now is concentrating on work that is taking her in new directions, which I think she's going to tell us about in this conversation. So, Barbara, welcome. And if I missed anything, first of all, in your bio that you'd like to tell us, let's start there. What did I skip over? You've had a long and varied career. Hi, Sheila. Thanks for having me on the show today. I think you got got the high points. All right. Well, thank Um, you. (laughs) One of the things that I'd, I'd like you to tell us about is I know you're off to the airport tomorrow for a very special gig in California. Um, You'll be leaving some snow and ice and going to the high desert, you said. Can you describe that work and how it came into your life, what you'll be doing this next week? Um, Sure. It's pretty much of a hoot. It just dropped in my lap just about a week ago. A man, I consider him a friend. I've never met him, but we have emailed and worked together on some brain injury projects. His name is Shad Mishad. He's founder of the National Veterans Foundation, and he's... um, fan of my book, The After Brain Injury, Telling Your Story, because he works with veterans with brain injury and and PTSD. And a friend of his, who's also on the board, happens to run a world-famous stunt driving school in California. Mm -hmm. And at this school, they're going to be working with a young man in his 30s who had a terrible brain injury when he was 17. And he's now 34, and Rick is going to just show him not how not to stunt drive, but just to drive again. And so Shad recommended that I be there to help with journaling to add another element to the experience, and that's how it happened. It came totally out of the blue, and I'm pretty excited about so it. So you're going to be, in effect, a writing tutor this week? Yes, yes, a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And how do you, as a writer with history of your own writing, interpret your skills and your lessons for this specific purpose? Well, um, I don't really use anything that could be considered really creative writing or writing for publishing with my journaling work. It's more about self-expression for the person who's doing the journaling so that they can learn more about what's going on with them in their hearts, in their lives, and um, maybe a lot of times come up with a new perspective or a new interpretation. You know, as I listen to you, Barbara, I think, well, that is the definition of creative writing (laughs) for (laughs) me. (laughs) That's true. That's true. But the aim of journaling is not to publish it. It's not to polish it um, and revise it. It's just to get it out there on the page and see what happens. And I think that's the first step most of us creative writers need to take with our writing before Mm -hmm. we start shaping it. So um, how will you go about this? Well, I have some exercises we're going to do. And I also talk at brain injury conferences and other events and give short workshops on journaling. And a lot of the exercises I do are the same. Um, A basic one that anybody can do is to write down three words just describing how you're feeling at the moment. For example, hungry, grouchy, satisfied? Not that sure. those go together, sure. but... And then you can do some writing or come back later in the day and write down three words how you feel 
at that time. Uh-huh. And it's, it's nothing really in depth, but it gives you a little bit of a record. And especially if you've written your first set of three words and come back after you've do, done some writing or something creative and you write another set of three words, a lot of times they're different. And if you were feeling not so good in the beginning, a lot of times you feel better in the end. And you have a record of that, so that's uh-huh. helpful. So how did you combine your knowledge from all the different venues you did freelance writing for with what you know now about how to help people with brain trauma injuries? It sounds to me like you you know something about what's useful about language when we're trying to regain skills and abilities with our thinking. Right. Um, journaling, I think, after, especially journaling after brain injury, it gives people an opportunity to really explore what happened to them in ways that the traditional therapies like physical therapy, speech therapy, cognitive therapy, they don't go into that. And so if people can do some journaling, particularly if they're in a supportive group, like the groups that I lead, they can really discover more about themselves. They can bolster their, self, their self-confidence. If they keep a journal over time, they have a record of where they were and where they are today so they can see that they've made progress. Because nice. sometimes you hit a plateau or it's just been a bad time. You think, oh, I'm never going to make any progress. And then you can look in your journal and find out that you have. So um, I know that you have some very personal experience with this because of your husband Ken's injury. Can you speak to that at all? Can you tell us how you've seen this journaling help at home too, as well as with your students and clients? Sure. <clears throat> Ken's injury was in 2003. So it's almost 10 years this month. And then I started the journaling group in 2004 in Tucson, just sort of as an experiment at a rehab hospital there to see what would happen. And it was successful. It was a hit. And so I started doing it there. And Ken has been to just about every one of the sessions. There are six-week sessions. Um, There were two a year in Tucson. And here in Indiana, we're doing once a quarter. So there are four sessions a year. And he's been to most of them. And it's been really interesting for me to see his perception change over the years. And that happens to a lot of people because a lot of the participants come back time after time, and it's really, really cool to see their perception change over time. And when you say that, their perception of, of what? Of their, their whatever caused their brain injury, their life with brain injury. One of the things we do, we use the book, After Brain Injury, Telling Your Story, so if people keep coming back, we tend to do a lot of the same exercises. But... If they've done it several times and they start thinking, well, maybe I can look at this in a different way Mm -hmm. and explore it in a different way. And so um, they do, and it's really really amazing sometimes. So let's go back to that. It's just been a five-minute write. I believe you, and I know that one of the things in teaching creative writing that I come up against is people saying they don't have time to write, and that's their biggest problem. Mm -hmm. And I use 10 minutes. I say, you have 10 minutes somewhere in your day to write. It's amazing how much you can do. And in class, of course, they write in a day-long seminar maybe eight pieces, Mm -hmm. um, which is more than they've done in months. So I'm an absolute believer in short periods of time allow us to say a lot. I'm curious Mm -hmm. to go back to the fact that you had an idea that journaling could help. And is that based on years of your own journaling? I'd like to know more about the connection between journaling in your life or in your studies and your outreach to other people thinking maybe this will work and getting other people to allow you to try it. Well, I journaled, I started journaling in the early 90s when I felt really trapped in a a corporate job. And at that time, my journaling was mainly venting and whining on the page because mm-hmm. um, I didn't really know any techniques. I just felt like I needed to have a record and to get it out. And then I journaled on and off. And then I met Ken. We got married. He had the accident in 2003, and I had my journal with me every day. Something told me that I should keep a record of what was happening because, for one thing, it was a very confusing time for me. And all the medical stuff going on, I wanted to have a record of what Ken was doing. And I just needed a place to express myself because it was a crazy time. It was, it was a really horrible time. And I was actually diagnosed by a counselor with secondary traumatic stress. And we agreed that journaling, if doing nothing else um, than to get my feelings out on the page, was helpful. So I kept doing that. So Ken recovered fairly well. And then in 2007, I had an idea that journaling 
was very helpful for me, and I wondered if it would be helpful for people with brain injury. Because I'd read several books on journaling and tried different techniques, and I knew it was beneficial. And so that's, that's where it all started, really. Thank you. I know, having read your memoir, What I Thought I Knew, you've got very poignant descriptions of visits to the hospital and writing things down. And I think, you know, the gift of language is the gift of what you say is examining our perceptions, keeping our minds and mm-hmm. hearts clear, delving into things that we might not be able to tell anybody else. So I, I find it exhilarating and extraordinary that you took your personal experience and approached people in a hospital, I'm wondering who that was, and said, can I teach this? Can mm-hmm. you tell us about that? Sure. Um, the person I approached, um, her name is Susan Schuster, and she's actually the co-author of the um, After Brain Injury Telling Your Story, but she was Ken's outpatient speech therapist, and she was tremendous. I cannot say enough good things about her. She's great. And we had gotten to be friends, and so when I had this idea, I talked to her about it, and she really liked it. She thought it would be beneficial, too, because um, along with just sort of the self-expression part, speech therapists also work with it's called it's cognitive therapy, how, your thinking processes. And so she knew if people would start writing about what was happening to them and going on with them, it could help them with their cognition. It could help with communication skills. And so I put together a proposal, and we went to her CEO, and the CEO loved it. She gave us a go-ahead, and that's where we started. And the process here in Indiana was pretty much the same when we moved here in 2011, we started going to a brain injury support group here at the local Health South, and um, I introduced myself to the outpatient speech therapist, Dawn Westfall, who runs the group. She loved the idea, too, and so there we are. Oh, that's great. I know that when bad things happen, one of the ways to heal is to give, give back, and it sounds like you've done that so well, and I, I think that you have to, I have to honor the fact that you've done so much good service for so many people and also helped yourself and can deal with what is a very large and difficult situation. So Susan Schuster became your co-writer after the project. Somewhere along the line, you just realized the two of you could write a book? Yeah, I was kind of one of those light bulb moments that this class could be a book. So um, I wrote 98% of the book. She was more of a technical advisor. Um, And the book came out in 2009 from Lash and Associates. It's available on Amazon. So people can work with this book as if they were in a group that you were leading and do the exercises and learn about Mm -hmm. the ways in which journaling can help them? Right. They can can do it individually. Or I know um, some therapists who use it, some speech therapists use it with groups. The state of Washington has purchased, I think, 100 copies that they gave to their support groups and they use them. So it's being used in different ways. One man told me one time that his wife didn't like to write. She was on the brain injury, and she couldn't really write too well, but they used the book as a conversation starter mm. so they could discuss things they hadn't discussed before, and he, he said it was valuable that way, too. You are listening to KPTZ 91.9 Port Townsend. In case you've just joined us, our program is In Conversation with Sheila Bender, Discussions on Writing and the Writing Life. So with all of the work that you're doing right now, are you writing personal essays anymore? Are you exploring other genres? I haven't been doing a lot of freelance writing because I gave up freelance writing as a career several years ago to concentrate on the journaling I, I attended or I took classes and became a certified journal facilitator, and that's mainly what I do now. But I still do some writing, mainly about brain injury. I just wrote an essay for, uh, there's a new chicken soup book coming out. It's Chicken Soup, um, Recovering from Traumatic Brain Injury, so I hope that gets in there. But in terms of going back to just being a, a writer for magazines on a variety of subjects, that's I kind of burned out, actually, and the market has changed a lot. And I'm much happier doing what I'm doing now. So, But it sounds to me like you're folding in your other kinds of writing mm-hmm. into the focus you have now. So this ch- chicken soup for the soul, for the, say it again, chicken soup for... Th- I think it's chicken soup for the soul uh, recovering from traumatic brain injury, I think. The fact that that series is devoting a whole book to this kind of mm-hmm. essay must mean that there's a lot of interest and also a lot of uh, difficulty out there because I don't know that we hear about brain injury 
commonly. And yet I know from your work and from people working with returning vets that this is a, a very big situation. I don't want to say problem because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want to focus on the fact, that, like you are, that it's a situation that people can learn to explore and deal with. Right. What are the statistics? Do you know about this population? Um, I think the latest statistics from the CDC say that I think it's three and a half million people a year suffer a brain injury. Now, that can range from a concussion, which is a brain injury. A lot of people don't realize that, but it is, um, which can often, people can often recover from a concussion with the proper rest and treatment. And it, it ranges all the way up to the very severe injuries where people are in comas. They may never recover from that. So there's a whole spectrum. But between all the in, information coming out about Um, concussions in football and contact sports and with the veteran issues from the wars, it's become more prominent in our our public awareness. And that's good because brain injury typically is hidden. Mm -hmm. A lot of people with brain injury don't look like there's anything wrong with them because a lot of the times the injury is to their cognition so they can be out in public and people say, oh, you look just fine. What's wrong with you? Right. But even a mild brain injury can cause uh, lifelong deficits that can cause some really terrible problems. And the brain injury does not affect just the individual, of course, it affects the whole family. So the numbers of people affected by brain injury, you think if there's three and a half million people that have one every year, along with five million people who live with deficits, there are millions and millions and millions of people who are touched by brain injury. So given that, do you propose or have you experienced with journaling workshops for those who are caregivers or living with people with brain injury? Well, I actually do journaling workshops for family caregivers also. Mm-hmm. I think next year I'll probably start another journaling book for caregivers because as a former caregiver myself, I know how important it is to have a place where you can talk freely, let your hair down, not be judged or criticized, and be with other people who understand what you're going through. Right. So how do you think those journaling groups would differ from the ones for the actual person who's got the brain injury in terms of your exercises or focus, how you might instruct them to write? Well, the caregiver groups that I do, they're a little more free-flowing. And we deal with issues like ambiguous loss and sorrow and grief and maintaining hope. The issues are different for the caregiver than for the person with the injury. So a lot of times I'll modify the group depending on what people want to talk about. I was wondering if you could tell us something about the poignancy of some of these journal entries or the growth you see in those people in in the way the journaling works for them. Do they, for instance, do they share what they wrote? Do they, is that an opportunity if they'd like to take it? In both of the groups for the survivors and the caregivers, uh, people always have the opportunity to share what they've written and, In some ways, I think that's the best part of the group because the writing is connection with themselves, and if they choose to share, that's connecting with other people. So they can see that that woman across the table is going through the same thing I'm going through with my husband, and now there's someone here who will understand what I'm going through. A lot of times in the caregivers groups, um, especially in the beginning of the six weeks, there are a lot of tears because it's a very difficult subject, and People many times have not had anybody to talk to about it before. It's all been bottled up. So between the writing and the sharing, um, it's a big emotional release. Right. It, can be, it can be really touching. Do you find that the writing itself, because it is so much from the heart, I'll use the word skillful, it just even though people might not be trained as writers because of the topic, because of the opportunity to write about it, are you experiencing some skillful writing? Sometimes. But I always tell them that whatever they write is perfect. Of course. And not to judge it. It's not graded. Nobody's going to come along and criticize it. So occasionally someone really comes up with something that, in a literary sense, might be considered very skillful. But that doesn't happen too much. But since the writing is from the heart, a lot of it is very touching in any case. Right. So you said that your next project is probably going to be a book on journaling for caregivers of people with brain injury. And do you have any other plans for your future writing? Well, I tend not to plan. I'm not a person who plans far in advance. And at this point, with the workshops I'm leading here locally and the traveling I'm doing, the plans for the caregiver book 
<laughs> That's pretty much it. Your plate is full. I, I am, but I am looking down the road. Um, I met a woman who is a psychiatrist. She was in the Army for 34 years, who is herself um, being treated for PTSD, and we've been tossing around an idea to put together a journaling workshop for, for women veterans. So I'm not sure if or when that will happen, but that's something... Um, I would really like to do, so we'll see. So it sounds like once you're involved, you keep on finding new people that you can collaborate with, and I think that's a very special mm-hmm. situation. Lots of writers don't find so many collaborators, and a lot of projects kind of don't get done. I think there's an extra energy when you have somebody that you're working with. Do you find that? I do. Um, I tend to be more of a solitary writer, and when putting together a workshop, particularly for like women veterans who may be suffering with PTSD. And since I'm not a therapist, I, I would feel nervous doing something like that on my own. But working with the psychiatrist who has firsthand experience plus experience um, working with people um, as a doctor for all these years, that would feel really good. Do you feel grateful for your skill as a writer um, and your knowledge about how writing has helped you? Does it, is there a sense of gratitude that, that allowed you oh, to? Oh, yes. Yeah. You want to talk about that a little bit? I feel that, I'm okay, I'm, I just turned 62, and I've been doing this work now for about, really in depth for about, well, since 2007, 2008, and I finally found my niche with this work now, with the journaling. I feel like I'm really making a difference mm-hmm. in some people's lives, and I have a, a, a deep sense of gratitude for that, and that everything has sort of fallen into place. Ever since Ken's accident, that brought me to this place where I am today. If Ken hadn't gone through this accident and this injury, I wouldn't be doing this today. And so I'm, in a way, I'm grateful to him, and we kind of have a standing joke, you know, like, thanks, honey, for having a brain injury so I can <laughs> do this work. Because he did recover well, and he's very supportive. Everything has just sort of fallen into place, and I'm very, very grateful for all of that. I know that when you've exercised your writing muscle, and then can use that muscle to help other people exercise, mm-hmm. it's, it's a very, very exhilarating feeling mm-hmm. because you're sharing something that you so deeply believe in and have practiced. Mm-hmm. And know, you know, even if you've turned your back, so to speak, on your corporate writing and your freelance writing, um, those years of practice, of staying on top of it, of making yourself heard in a variety of ways, on a variety of subjects for a variety of venues – is really important experience that you've been able to bring into the work you're doing now and then share with other people. And I just want to myself say thank you for, for doing that and for raising the visibility of writing. And you've taught a speech therapist about it. You're teaching psychiatrists about it. What other professionals do you think have now paid attention to the importance of writing in healing? Well, there is um, more of a movement afoot in various places I mean, the military, for instance, recommends journaling Wow! for coping with PTSD. I've seen, like, the Army Times newspaper and places like that. There's a Veterans Writing Project, uh, which is creative writing led by uh, combat vets who all have MFAs, and that's available for anybody, uh, a military family member or active duty or someone who's back home after being deployed. Are they workshops? Yes, they're workshops. Around the country? I believe they're free to the veterans mm-hmm. or to the people who attend. So people interested um, would call their Veterans Administration and ask about it? No, it, this, is, this is not the Veterans Administration. Oh. It's the Veterans Writing Project, and you can look that. It's online, Uh huh. Um, and you'll find all the information there. Thank you. Veterans Writing Project. Any other thoughts you have on the visibility of writing in the community of people in need of healing? Well, there's, there's more um, coming out, too, about narrative medicine, which is helping to teach medical professionals about writing so they can be more in tune with themselves, so they can be more in tune with their patients. I know therapists a lot of times use, are using journaling with their patients. So little by little, I think writing is getting out there. You know John Fox, of course. Right. Um, Maybe we want to say so who he, he, he is. His is poetic he, medicine. He, he, and I can't remember the name of his website, but he's a poet. And he works with people in hospitals and different areas to, to help them uh, write poetry and use poetry to help them heal. So, and there's, there's the National Association for Poetry Therapy. I think it's, it's running under the radar, I think, of 
of most people's consciousness, but it's definitely there. Mm-hmm. And I think it's spreading, which makes me happy. <laughs> it sounds like a good thing to spread. Spreading is yes. an ominous word, but I think in this case, it's a really good one. <laughs> so before we close our conversation, are there any other things you'd like us to know about your work or about writing, your writing? I can't really think of anything. You think we've covered um, it, huh? But I know, I know I, that. I think we have. Okay. We have. What do you think about people who just um, might have the ability to form their own groups if there are not groups around them like the ones you've been able to offer in Indiana and also in Arizona. Do you have any advice for people who just might want to figure out how to do this, say buy your book and get together with people? Certainly people can do that. I think, you know, they would have to know a little bit about journaling beforehand. They would have to know how to facilitate a group so that it's a safe place where everybody feels respected. Mm -hmm. If, if they can do that, I think it's possible to do it. So it may be that people in the community who feel a need for this could approach professionals like you did at the hospital mm-hmm. and say, we would really like to work together to do this. And maybe mm-hmm. more and more groups would sprout around the country. Well, before we close, let's talk just a, a minute or two about your upcoming gig that you're leaving for tomorrow. What for you is the challenge in working with one individual on a tight timeline. Yeah, this will uh, this will be the first time I've worked with an individual. His dad is also coming, so I'm going to invite him to write and the the stunt driver himself, anybody who's there is I'm going to invite them to write because they can all participate. Mm-hmm. But I think the, an advantage here is even though I have a short sort of program planned, I can modify it as need be depending on what happens. Can you give us an example of one of the exercises you might do with the stunt driver and anyone who's also participating? I think one thing I'm going to do on the last day, there's a a journal exercise called Perspective where you would date your page in advance. So let's say you would date your page a year from today, and then you write in the uh, first-person present tense describing what your life is on that day as if it's actually happening um, to kind of point you forward in that direction. So he could write about you know, how drive, being able to drive again has improved his life and helped him in different ways. The kind of effect that just, you know, this thing we all take for granted, being able to drive, how having that skill back right. has helped him in his life. I'm trying to think of another one. There's another one. I just start with Once Upon a Time, uh-huh. and then you write in third person, so, you know, he or she, and kind of turn it into more of a story. And that can be good for people who are dealing with trauma because it can give them a little bit of a distance by writing in third person. Right. And right. we're all familiar with that once upon a time phrase and that can be comforting too. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll probably be using both of those. Thank the you. Once upon a time and the perspective. I like those two ideas for any of us who want to create a mm-hmm. new piece of writing or yeah, are journaling. Very valuable. So I, I want to thank you mm-hmm. so much for your time and for sharing your work with us. I just want to repeat the name of your books. What I Thought I Knew is a collection of personal essays, linked personal essays, a memoir, and then After Brain Injury, Telling Your Story, which was co-written uh, with Susan B. Schuster and Barbara Stahur. Thank you so, so much, and good luck to you in California. Oh, thank you so much, Sheila. It was great talking with you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. In Conversation is produced by Sheila Bender and edited by... <laughs>